Welcome. Welcome to Becoming America. Actually, the full title being Becoming America. America is a perfect idea. The United States of America is a work in progress. But this is an ongoing discussion about the Constitutional Convention, ours in 1787. This is the 11th of our series. And as you've heard before, uh, we are here talking about real issues, who wrote the issues, who decided them. The theme, in fact, of today will be the separation of powers and the checks and balances that our founders put into the Constitution. Of course, our goal is to educate, is to inform, is to inspire, is to entertain as well, but we're trying always, of course, to be faithful to history. So we will try to instill pride in our country or reinstill it, depending on the circumstances. So my co-hosts, as always, are Dr. Joe Ellen Chatham, we call her the professor for very good reason, as well as the Honorable Bijan Keon, we call the American. Why? Well, talk about honorable. He's been confirmed by the United States Senate twice, which is certainly twice more than I have. So he is truly an honorable man as well. And speaking about honorable, today, as we always do, we have a guest. This time, we really exceeded ourselves from my standpoint, the truly honorable Tom Campbell. Uh, in fact, you may remember that he was with us in our sixth episode on Remember the Ladies. So we've invited him back for obvious reasons. I'll talk a little bit more, Tom, about you, give you a chance to say a few things too as we go. But we begin always with a song. As, as you know, if you've been with us, uh, we had end up with the convention, The Birth of America, and it becomes from the musical that I wrote along with two of my partners, wonderful fellows, Steve Lawless and Joel Henry Stein. Uh, and it tells the story, of course, of the Constitutional Convention in kind of an upbeat, musical, fun way. So today we get into the song, the 11th song, Policy Wonk. Now look, here we have conversations going on. These people were human. They debated, they argued, they bickered with each other a lot. And then of course, they also talked with the townspeople, uh, the delegates, the townspeople, the devil is in the details as you'll hear, but they argued and everything else, but they had to come up with the most important thing. And they, they argued about virtually everything. And I've said this several times during our series, but the thing that each of the delegates believed was the most important function of government was to protect our liberties from the encroachment of government. Number two in court was keeping us safe. So they all agreed on that. They didn't agree on very much more. So they argued, they bickered about the details and the language. They were in this convention for four months, four months in a hot, humid Philadelphia, uh, six days per week, started about mid-morning, ended up in late afternoon, stayed up late at night, and they talked in the taverns, they talked in the boarding houses, they talked about compromises, they got into various strategies, etc. They became the policy wonks, and they gave a little listen to it. Let's hear the, what they said. Wonk, 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 they're the policy wonks. And they talk, 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 till the hands on the clock say it's time for bed. But inside their heads, the wonks keep wonking along. So they sit upright in the middle of the night. And they write, write, write of whatever they might. And they pray for wisdom and for clear insight And they hope they don't get this all wrong Now you may guffaw as we lay down the law In minutia and exasperating retail But in time you'll realize And it should be no surprise That the devil resides within the deep in the past it's always been that the king or the queen announces this is how it's going to be. But now we have to govern if we're northern or we're southern because now it's up to you and me. And so we wonk, 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 we're the policy wonks and we talk, talk, talk till the hands on the clock say it's time for bed but inside our heads the wonks keep wonking along so we sit upright 
right in the middle of the night. And they write, write, write of whatever they might. And we pray for wisdom and for clear insight. And we hope we won't get this all wrong. What is to be or not to be the quality of policy that guides us on this odyssey of ours? Now that we have our sovereignty, it seems there really ought to be a better way to divvy up our powers. We invent a whole new science in defiance of the tyrants who would once again deny us liberty. We need a whole new creed, a different scheme, because it seems that now with freedom comes responsibility. And so they wonk, 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 they're the policy wonks. And they talk, 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 till the hands on the clock say it's time for bed. But inside their heads, the wonks keep wonking along. So they sit upright in the middle of the night, and they write, write, write of whatever they might, and they pray for wisdom and for clear insight, and they pray we won't get this all wrong. What now is to be or make to be the first day of promise in my guise us on this odyssey of ours? Now that we have our sovereignty, it seems there really ought to be a better way to divvy up our powers. We advance the whole science than defiant of the tyrant and would once again deny us liberty. We need a whole new creed, a different story, because it's so that now we'll now we'll turn to you. Where the policy walks And they talk, talk, talk Till the hands on the clock Say it's time for bed But inside their heads The wonks keep walking along So they sit upright In the middle of the night And they write, write, write Of whatever they might And they pray for wisdom and for clear insight and we say they won't get this all wrong so you heard the policy wonks i hope you enjoyed the song but the policy wonks may have been wonking along at during the constitutional convention hoping that they got it right and i believe that they did but as the song says in the past it's always been the king or the queen who announces how it's going to be but now we have to govern whether we're Northern or we're Southern because now it's up to me. So we're going to become the power wonks or the power, the policy wonks. And there ought to be a better way of divvying up our powers. Well, to guide us through that discussion about how the founders did divvy up their powers is our guest, again, the Honorable Tom Campbell. Now, Tom, I've said this and I don't mean to embarrass you, but I've said this publicly, you have one of the most impressive resumes uh, imposing resumes of anyone that I've ever heard of. Uh, you started, and just to begin here, uh, in the PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, and now my envy will truly come forth because your faculty advisor was Dr. Milton Friedman, a longtime hero of mine. Then he went to Harvard Law School where he was an editor, graduated magna cum laude, then was a law clerk for Judge George McKinnon, who was in the United States Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit. What an amazing opportunity that would have been to have been exceeded only really by having been a law clerk for Justice Byron Quizzer White in the United States Supreme Court. Just a marvelous opportunity. Then later on, he was a state senator from the state of California. Honestly, the California Journal rated Tom Campbell as the best overall state senator. They said he was the most ethical. They said he was the best problem solver and just exceeded our, our expectations. 
then was a five-term member of Congress out of San Jose, was a member of the House of Representatives. He authored during that time, and I'm going to question you about this, Tom, two resolutions at the same time when President Clinton put our troops into Kosovo, the former Yugoslavia. One declaration was to get a declaration of war under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution to make it legal for our troops to be there. And the second one was to get our troops out of Kosovo because there was no declaration of war. Talk about ethics, talk about somebody to really put it on the line. That's our guest, Tom Campbell, to talk about the ins and outs of the separation of powers. He was also, by the way, parenthetically, the director of finance for the state of California. He was then the dean of the business school, the Haas Business School at UC Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, a righteously wonderful place. Then the dean of the Fowler School of Law at Chapman University, where he continues to be a professor of economics and law at Chapman. So he has an amazing resume, but I haven't gotten to the most important one, the most impressive one, and that is Tom Campbell has been married for more than 40 years to Suzanne, who is a wonderful woman in her own right. Uh, by the way, with the fall of the Soviet Union, if I have this right, Tom, she ended up with the UC Berkeley, ending up into a partnership with the University of St. Petersburg, and she helped establish the first business school in what is now Russia or the former Soviet Union. So this is our fellow Tom Campbell. Welcome back. Nice of you to be with again us here in Becoming America. Well, thank so, you. Thank you for having me. Well, you're indeed so. So let me let me ask the first question. You know. We're concerned that the government can get out of control. The drafters of the Constitution really created a system based on federalism. What's that? You know, allowing each state to decide how to best rule themselves unless the Constitution delegated those powers to the federal government. And if they did, then we had a separation of powers, a checks and balances so that one part of government could not get too strong. So let's examine each of these, as well as some of the other devilish details the, found, the founders grappled with. So becoming America, let me begin with the first question. The Articles of Confederation were literally kind of a confederation of states. The Constitution replaced it with a federal system. So what's the difference between the two and really why does it matter? It matters immensely because of the safety for the individual that comes from separating power that is lodged in government. The Articles of Confederation maximized the safety of the individual, but subjected each individual to the potential uh, overreach of the state governments. And that would even affect the possibility that one state could impose uh, uh, punishments uh, for actions in regard to another state. Traveling between one state and another could be subject to a, a toll, uh, a toll gate, a tariff on goods between the, the, uh, the two states. Uh, and so the eventual call for a reform of the Articles of Confederation led to the convention in Philadelphia that you so aptly described in your musical. Uh, the convention started out proposing that there be some changes in the Articles of Confederation. They ended up substituting an entire new document. That document preserved much of the individual liberties of the Articles of Confederation. It did not, however, have a Bill of Rights and that was specified in the first 10 amendments that were passed by the first Congress uh, after the ratification of the, of the new constitution. The separation of powers remained an essential part. The, the power particularly given to the executive, which was new, the Articles of Confederation uh, did not have that office of president, uh, was care carefully restricted uh, so that we would not have a king or someone who would exercise authority like a king. And uh, that balance became strained in the early days of the Constitution uh, with the development of what we would call today somewhat uh, mild uh, actions by the federal government, like establishing uh, the Treasury Department or the National Bank. Uh, we then had the tremendous uh, tearing apart of our country in the Civil War and the stitching back together with a stronger central government um, and then to, up to the common up to the common era, the, the more recent time, uh, with the, the growth of power in the executive with occasional reassertions of the rights of the other branches of government and rights of the states. Tom, I, I've done a lot of talking and I'm gonna back off now, but just give us some examples of checks and balances that we instituted in the federal system through the constitution. 
probably the most important one is that the federal government has no powers unless they are explicitly given to the federal government. So the default is the states or the individual person has power. And that's specified in the 10th amendment, the last of the Bill of Rights. So the most important is if you can't find a power for the federal government explicitly in the constitution, the federal government does not have it. Now that principle has been strained a great deal because of the interstate commerce clause. Congress was given the authority under article one, section eight uh, to regulate commerce between states and between the United States and foreign governments. And over the years, the interpretation of that phrase has been expanded. Uh, however, it still remains true. And occasionally the Supreme Court will rise to prominence, raise to prominence once again, uh, the 10th Amendment. Uh, for example, when the Congress attempted to regulate the pay structures of state employees, uh, they were struck down and told, no, you cannot. Uh, or where the federal government, the Congress attempted to dragoon the states into uh, uh, administering the uh, Obamacare, the uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, once more, the federal government was, said, was, was ordered, you can't do that. The states are free to use their own resources in the manner they think best. If the federal government wants a program, the federal government had better provide for it and not just tell the states that that is what they should do. The other big development that concerns me, and perhaps uh, we should uh, uh, do, do all well, definitely we should do all we can, and perhaps you should discuss how, uh, to reinvigorate uh, the courts uh, as, a, as a means of standing up to the overreach. Uh, what I found to my sadness, and indeed the particular instance involving the War Powers Act, is that where one branch steps over the line, uh, the third branch, the judicial branch, ought to be the umpire uh, that calls the foul and, and announces it. Uh, and then the political branches, the Congress and the president should set about rectifying it. Uh, but we are in a serious uh, deficiency on the issue of separation of powers because Congress has willingly given power to the president or the president has taken the power and the Congress has said nothing. And in both instances, the courts have been quite reticent to step in and, and announce the violation as it occurred. So those are some important challenges for us inheritors of the document uh, that we revere. Tom, I think we're gonna go into the war powers issue um, a little more in detail as well as the role of the courts. But you referred to article one, section eight um, part of the separation of powers was not only separation of powers of the three branches on the federal level, but also the separation of power between the states and the national government when you've mentioned. But when the founders put the constitution together, it's in large part a process document. It says, here's how we are going to govern. But then there is the what that they're allowed to govern. And that's largely in article one, section eight, where the Constitution spells out what the federal government through the Congress may do. It can uh, list a lot of things, but the problem is the bottom of that list is said it can also do what is necessary and proper to accommodate all of the enumerated powers. The problem is what I find necessary and proper is probably very different than what somebody else might find to be necessary and proper. Could you give us a little history on the necessary and proper clause and, uh, and how, it, uh, how was it operated through time and, uh, and particularly with maybe the, uh, the creation of the national banks? Well, you're referring to uh, Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in McCulloch versus Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's, the, here's the issue. Uh, there's nothing in the constitution about establishing a department of the treasury. There's nothing in the constitution about creating a national bank. And uh, so with the uh, Federalists and particularly under the influence of Alexander Hamilton, the fiscal power um, was accumulated in the executive branch and in the national government as opposed to the states. It was Alexander Hamilton's idea that the debts incurred by the uh, colonies in fighting the war and subsequent to the, uh, the, at the Treaty of Paris uh, be assumed by the United States as a way of binding the new, the new country together. Uh, 
And to facilitate that, uh, Hamilton and then successor uh, presidents of the Federalist uh, uh, nature, but not of Jefferson or Jackson, who are more of the populist nature, uh, but the Federalist pre uh, presidents uh, proposed and in, in, uh, created a, a national bank, two of them actually, the Bank of the United States to uh, collect the debts owed to the United States and to issue uh, payments due to others from the United States. Uh, and along with that, of course, came the opportunity to create money, uh, which uh, uh, as Dr. Milton Friedman uh, has warned us, and Jim was nice to mention him in the introduction, uh, is the, potentially the greatest pernicious, the most pernicious power government has uh, when it simply uh, prints money. Uh, so the case came along as to whether the uh, Bank of the United States was constitutional. And the populist sentiment was, uh, well, this was too much power. And uh, it was uh, uh, looking after the mercantile interests of New England and hurting the farming interests of the South and the newly expanding West. The case went to the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice was, was uh, still John Marshall, who had uh, uh, been appointed uh, under the Federalist administrations. And uh, he, he ruled that it, even though it wasn't specific, it was necessary and proper uh, that uh, we have a bank in order to carry out interstate commerce and the authority to coin money. Uh, that was an explicit. So those are the two explicit powers in the Article One, Section 8. And as long as you can anchor some exercise of power uh, to any, a specific grant, uh, then necessary and proper will allow you to expand. So that's the, that was the early history. Since then, uh, Joellen, the necessary and proper clause has essentially become secondary uh, to the expansion of the commerce clause. So let me just repeat for emphasis, you have to find an explicit power and then the things you can do to advance that explicit power will be permitted uh, sufficient if the nexus is sufficient. Uh, I should say sufficiently close. But it was the expansion of the commerce power which really led to the greatest growth of the federal government. And, uh, and that came first of all in the, in the uh, Civil War with uh, uh, President Lincoln, uh, but uh, most of all under the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt. So Tom, uh, you use the word pernicious, and I like to uh, go a little deeper on, on that, on that uh, separation of power and uh, an issue that's like the uh, elephant in the room that no one wants to really talk about it. And it's if, if the Constitution gave only the Congress to make laws, um, what is the role of these dozen or maybe even more? I, I'm not even sure how many agencies in the United States government actually do legislate. They create laws and they have the means to enforce those laws and they won't hesitate to do so. Um, uh, and, you know, we can, we can use examples like, you know, very good agencies, very apparently needed, of course. I mean, who could argue with the uh, safety rules at work developed by uh, the organizations that deal with health standards and safety standards? No one can argue with that. So it's not an argument against the existence, uh, but it's, it's a question and it's a pernicious question because isn't this an interference isn't this a violation of constitutional intentions that these agencies do have these enormous administrative powers without having been given that right by the Constitution? And my question specifically is, why is Congress silent on this issue? Why is it that our elected representatives, certainly you uh, served uh, five terms, uh, and we thank you for that service, um, what is Congress's, uh, the root of Congress's silence on this issue? And maybe I'm just being presumptuous, maybe Congress hasn't been silenced on this uh, particular issue, but could you open this up and tell our viewers, you know, how does, how does the administrative state, uh, which is now, of course, getting more interestingly important because other issues are coming about, about the insertion of rules by entities that clearly, at least to us, the students of Constitution, 
does not have a basis in the intent of the drafters of the Constitution. Tell us a little bit about it. Where does it come from? Uh, how is it tolerated? And what's the future of it? I mean, are we going to go back to the intent, similar to the issues that you mentioned about the role of the courts? Who is going to bring this back to the frame that the Constitution meant for it, that only Congress will make laws? Very insightful question. The reason why we are in the problem area that we are with delegation of authority is because of executive branch desire to expand their own power, presidents and the people they appoint, and equally so, if not more so, Congress's willingness to give up the power. Uh, and I should add the court's unwillingness to blow the whistle uh, on, uh, on a violation of the rules. So let me speak about the first, the expansion of the role of the executive was hand in hand with the expansion of the role of the federal government. So when powers were largely, government powers were largely administered by the states, uh, you did not see this tendency by the executive at the federal level, the president, to accumulate power. There wasn't that much to do with the power. Uh, the uh, sorts of things that we think of as government today, and including rules about COVID, for example, or other uh, in, 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 in history, other communicable diseases. That, that was the matter for the states. Education, matter for the states. Um, property law, uh, marriage laws, inheritance laws, uh, all matters for the states. Indeed, uh, the federal government collected its revenue by tariffs. Uh, there was no income tax until the first part of the 20th century. So that's the first point that the growth of the federal government brought about the accumulation of power in the executive. And there are two, two major, major parts of the growth of the federal executive. One is the uh, power accumulating to the president during wartime. Uh, biggest illustrations are President Lincoln, President Wilson, and President Roosevelt. Um, and, uh, and the second is the growth of Congress's willingness to hand the power over. And that, sadly, is a question of lack of, of a political courage. Uh, I, I, there's an instance where maybe we'll, we'll get to it, where I actually uh, was confronted by the Speaker of the House and uh, the then uh, a minority leader, who was Dick Gebhardt, uh, asking me not to bring a vote to the floor of the House regarding war power, uh, because they didn't want to take the political risk. Uh, if you are a member of Congress, this is a sad truth, uh, you are oftentimes uh, attracted to the proposition that the president makes the difficult decisions, and you can always point to something in your record that uh, showed support for the decision of the presidents if it goes well, and something else in your record if it doesn't go well. And so the supine attitude of the legislative branch is equally responsible for this. Um, and then lastly, as I commented several times already, uh, this should have been observed and noted, even if not physically prevented by the third branch. Uh, the difference being that the third branch can only issue opinions. It has a small enforcement arm through the marshal service, but that's it. Um, the key would be that as, a, as the non-political branch, uh, the courts should announce when the separation of powers has been violated and present that to the facts as facts to the American public who then can take action in the form of removing those whom they've elected uh, for the having violated the separation of powers. Well, that, well, that's a follow-up follow question on that. You said removing the person who has violated the separation of powers. So uh, you mentioned President Lincoln and uh, um, uh, the historical the historical facts are there for us to go look at. But my question is, what really happens when the President of the United States uh, refuses to obey the laws passed by Congress? A good example of that would be President Lincoln's uh, suspending the uh, provisions of the writ of uh, habeas corpus. And uh, how did he get away with that? Uh, and with that with that historical, uh, precedents, if if you would, did did President Lincoln actually establish a precedence that a president can violate the laws passed by Congress and get away with it? 
is that is that how you know the rest of the history has taken place? And again, my question to you as a former uh, legislator. Uh, with those specific rights given to you and your colleagues to to legislate, uh, what happens when a president says, well, I don't think so, I'm not going to do this? Uh, is there historical instances where we see the other powers coming in and limiting the desires of, the, uh, of a commander-in-chief and the head of the executive branch to clearly violate the laws that you all passed in Congress. Uh, what's the future hold with that? Uh, do we have uh, a horizon where things could change or that sets the course for us to continue? We must close this chapter and agree that uh, you can violate the Constitution of the United States uh, by being an administrative agency or even the President of the United States. The head of the executive branch can violate the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I know this is a, a maybe, a, again, a pernicious question, but uh, I'm, I'm sure our viewers just love to hear uh, a voice of authority on this subject, <laughs> which we uh, certainly uh, respect you to convey uh, to the viewers your, your thoughts on this question. It's a chilling question, a concerning question. It brings to mind the historical precedent of the Roman Republic as it gave way to the Roman Empire. There was a Roman Senate which existed well into the period of the empire, but it was the accumulation of power that was taken and the by the emperor, emperor from the Senate that set the precedent for what followed. Um, I am alarmed about that. Uh, so President Lincoln, you mentioned, yes, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. That is to say, he put people in jail who were advocating for uh, secession um, and uh, instructed uh, his uh, uh, Department of Justice, his, his, uh, as well as his military, uh, to keep them in jail, including newspaper editors. Uh, the Supreme Court eventually ruled that this was unconstitutional, uh, but not during the pendency of the Civil War. So you see an early on pattern here that the I mentioned earlier about Congress not wanting to take a difficult decision. Here, the Supreme Court chose not to take a difficult position. Um, the issue, by the way, is, is uh, uh, a, mar a, a mark against President Lincoln. Uh, and I hasten to say he is the greatest president our country uh, ever had. So even a great a president can have failings. Uh, the, the, the step that needs to be taken then um, is to rein in a president who accumulates power uh, in a way that Congress has not willed. And as I pointed out, Congress has willed. During the New Deal, the Congress was overwhelmingly of the same political party as President Roosevelt. They gave him massive authority. Um, and in 1935, we had the first and sadly, from my point of view, last ruling by the Supreme Court that the Congress had given too much power to the executive, but they did so rule um, a case involving the National Industrial Recovery Act, which had essentially given to the administration, to President Roosevelt's administration, an agency called the National Recovery Administration, uh, the authority to set hours, uh, uh, output uh, and wages and prices. And that was too much, according to the Supreme Court. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court, however, then retreated uh, from that uh, position and did not strike down any other parts of the New Deal legislation. I want to fast forward to a time each of us remember, but some of my students don't, and that was uh, President Richard Nixon, uh, because it's another point to mention answering your question of what, what can we do to check the exercise of power? Well, President Nixon had accumulated a substantial amount of power, certainly President Lyndon Johnson before him. Um, and you might say that presidency was at its apex. Uh, when President Nixon uh, uh, gave instructions to his uh, Department of Justice, to his attorney general, to obstruct justice and gave those instructions to his White House staff as well, uh, 
a special prosecutor was appointed and the president politically had to accept the existence of a special prosecutor. And that special prosecutor went to court to obtain evidence against the president. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled eight to nothing uh, that the president of the United States had to turn over documents uh, that were being sought in a criminal investigation. Um, most tellingly, President Nixon had said that he would abide by a definitive ruling of the Supreme Court. Those are his words, a definitive ruling, suggesting that had it been something like five to three, there are nine justices, by the way, but Justice Rehnquist was new and had disqualified himself because he'd been part of the Nixon administration. Um, so had it been five to three, perhaps we would have had a real constitutional crisis, but it was eight to nothing and President Nixon uh, left office uh, soon thereafter under a threat of impeachment. Um, and lastly, I would say it does come down to this, the court, the third branch has to call the violation and then the political branches have to act. Um, impeachment is probably, strike probably, impeachment has been overused. Uh, it, is a, it is perceived as partisan, uh, but when impeachment was threatened against President Nixon, it was threatened in, the, in a bipartisan way. And indeed, it was Republican senators who convinced President Nixon that he would fail in his attempt uh, not to uh, be convicted in the Senate, that there were two thirds of the Senate prepared to convict him. And so he resigned. Uh, that kind of bipartisan use of impeachment is the fun most fundamental check against an overreaching president. Um, and a perhaps less severe one is one that we have every two years uh, where we can reward or punish those whom we have entrusted with power. Uh, and including on the scorecard, in my opinion, should be, did you stand up as a member of Congress to an encroachment by the president or did you just let it be because it was politically easier? Tom, at um, the time that we're recording this, which is you know, in December of 2021, we're living in a time when um, I think too many Americans and including legislators are too willing to give more power to the president. Um, we've had a couple of presidents recently who talk about using their pen and their phone because Congress was not doing what they wanted. And just in this last month, we have several members of Congress who are asking the president to use his pen and his phone because they can't get their way in Congress. We have a Senate that's divided 50-50 in a house that has a very slim democratic majority. So it's hard to get legislation through. But the point is that's their job to legislate. And that means defeat legislation as well as pass it because that's, that's the representative democratic process. We've got people who are willing to say, well, we can't get our way. So let's let the president exert authority he may not even have. And then we've had presidents, not only in this time, but occasionally in time past, but even this president right now, the courts have decided against some of his policies. And he has said, well, that's what the court says. And he hasn't lived up to it. So um, this brings up one other area that I'd like to address, and that is executive orders. The president can do certain things, and they are law called executive orders. Another president can perhaps undo that executive. What's the status of an executive order? What's its origin? And um, have they become too overreaching? Uh, the executive order is uh, most commonly uh, identified as starting under President Wilson. I don't wanna say that definitively, there may have been some before, but uh, certainly that's the modern expansion. The executive order uh, was an attempt to fill in in those areas where Congress has not legislated and not to supplant that legislation. And uh, you have quite uh, correctly identified how far it has gone. Uh, President Obama, for instance, tried to get the uh, Dreamers uh, statute uh, resolved uh, for the first six years of his presidency. Uh, when the Democratic Party uh, did not succeed in taking Congress, in his last two years, in 2014, President Obama then announced that everything he had said theretofore, that he lacked the power to suspend the laws about uh, who can be legally in our country. Um, he, he, he went back from that. 
And he said he had a pen and he had a phone. And so he issued an order that his United States attorneys simply not prosecute uh, for the illegal presence or illegal entry into our country of those in the category that commonly are called the dreamers. So you've got this authority growing up supposedly to fill in where the powers of the Congress have not been explicit. Uh, the executive order has even been uh, extended to the context of international diplomacy with what are called executive agreements, uh, short of a treaty. So an executive agreement, for example, was uh, President Roosevelt, President Franklin Roosevelt's agreement with uh, Joseph Stalin uh, that the uh, United States would uh, not allow its citizens to pursue lawsuits against the uh, remnants of the uh, property of the former uh, Russian uh, government in the United States. This was preparatory to uh, forming a closer alliance with uh, the Soviet Union, anticipating the events in Europe. Uh, and this took away the right of American citizens to go to court and, 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 and obtain satisfaction of their claims. Amazing ex expansion of power. Uh, and yet the Supreme Court uh, upheld it. And it was not a treaty that went before the Senate, which requires confirmation. It was just the president. Uh, there's one other category, which is um, regulations. So Congress will oftentimes pass laws and then say, we'll let the uh, correct administrative agency, or I should say the appropriate administrative agency, fill in the correct details by regulation. That at least has to follow a process. And that process includes public hearings, taking of evidence, promulgation of a, of a proposed rule, and then eventually application of a rule. But at the end, whether we're talking about executive agreements, executive orders, uh, regulations, uh, or failures to prosecute, which are none of those, that's the category I described with the, the dreamers, Congress, by passing a law, preempts them all. That is the ultimate authority. The problem is the president will veto that law and so unless you have two thirds of both houses, which is necessary to override a veto, the president wins. Well, and of course that's a check and balance as well. Tom, you have given a lot of nuance in, in, our, in our government. Life is complicated and we know that. <clears throat> also, of course, the courts have no army and they are fully aware of that. They have no police power. So like you said, they have to call attention of these violations of the constitution sometimes uh, and then have the executive enforce them or legislature. But a, a bright one that I threatened to talk to you about before, and, and I will now, is the declaration of war. It's clear in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, only Congress has that right, has that power. But they have. it isn't the president that's taken that power. It's the Congress that's given it to the president by these so-called War Powers Acts. So we have gone into Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Kosovo, uh, even Grenada and Panama without a declaration of war. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us of your experience in Kosovo when you were in Congress. And by the way, you're wearing a congressional tie too, I believe now, are you not? So <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> invoke that congressional authority. <laughs> I hasten to add that any American, any person can purchase this exact same tie at the gift shop in the Capitol. So it's an, uh, by no means a trapping of, of, uh, of nobility. Uh, the, the war power has been placed in the Congress for a very good reason. Abraham Lincoln, as a congressman, opposed the war against Mexico. And he said that uh, tyrants had for many ages been uh, using wars uh, as a way of accumulating power and that our founders were wise in preventing this uh, most tyrannical of all powers to be placed in the hands of one person. Uh, the the uh, last time we declared war was against uh, the allies of Nazi Germany, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and Hungary uh, in 1942. Uh, since then, we have gone to war, but not called it war. Now, you mentioned Afghanistan. I hasten to uh, note that President uh, George Bush uh, did obtain a resolution from Congress, President George uh, W. Bush, uh, to authorize the use of force in Afghanistan. It did not say declaration of war, but he did go to Congress. And so from the point of view of separation of powers, I think he did the right thing, whatever your view of the war in Afghanistan was. Uh, but the other examples that you gave are all 
without action by Congress to empower the president. The president's argument in each case was, well, I'm commander in chief. Uh, no, that's, that's not enough. That logically follows once war has been declared. Uh, indeed, President, uh, uh, during the administration of President Washington, Alexander Hamilton and um, James Madison had a dispute over this. Madison saying, look, if you make that the argument, the president could create a fait accompli, just put our troops in harm's way, and then they'll be attacked, and, and then uh, you will claim that you uh, didn't start the war, but you did, all without congressional approval. And uh, it was nice to see Madison stand up for that. Uh, he retreated from that position, nevertheless, when he was Secretary of State to President Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson wanted to wage war against the Barbary pirates. And Secretary of State Madison saw the wisdom of Alexander Hamilton's view that it was inherent in the powers of the, of the commander in chief. So that's the stress between the two theories. And the right way, in my judgment, in the separation of powers uh, scheme, to resolve a legitimate dispute between the two powers, the two, the two political branches, is to ask the third branch to resolve it. Uh, the court has on many occasions decided whether a particular circumstance amounted to war or not. They had to, for example, in interpreting insurance contracts, which had an act of war provision. So an individual loses property during the Civil War. The insurance company says we're not paying because it wasn't an act of war. The insured says, yes, it was. And the Supreme Court says, yes, it was. So even though a civil war is nowhere in the Constitution, uh, uh, the, the phrase civil war is nowhere in the Constitution. So the courts are available for this. And uh, in 1973, after Vietnam became uh, increasingly obvious, uh, a difficulty for the United States, um, Congress passed the War Powers Resolution that said basically this, uh, we know that there will be occasions when the president has to use force and uh, use it without coming to Congress first. Imagine if you went to Congress first before President Reagan invaded Grenada, we would have had Cuba, Cuban troops in Grenada and possibly the Soviet Union. So there's logic in giving the president some free freedom to act for a short period of time. But after 60 days, if you haven't gotten the explicit approval by Congress, then you must withdraw the troops. That's what the War Powers Act said. President v uh, Nixon vetoed it and it was passed over his veto more than two thirds of both houses. So when President uh, uh, Clinton began to bomb Belgrade um, in connection with the Kosovo war, um, I noted that this was a war, uh, that bombing a, another country is a war. We were paying our soldiers and air personnel a combat pay. Um, the Secretary of Defense admitted that it was hostilities. The uh, testimony from Secretary Albright, um, when I asked her, is this war? She said, uh, well, you're the law professor. I'll let you figure it out. Yeah, that's almost word for word what she said. It was a denigrating answer, one that did not respect separation of powers, the legitimate role for Congress. Um, so the War Powers Resolution says, if a president ignores this, then any member of Congress may come to the floor of her or his house or Senate and uh, demand a vote. So I did. And I brought two resolutions, one saying we hereby declare war on the Republic of Yugoslavia, which we had recognized at the time as the sovereign over Kosovo, or uh, pursuant to the War Powers Resolution, we hereby direct the president to withdraw all troops from the area of hostilities as, safely, as quickly as their safety will permit. Um, the Congress voted against both uh, they did not, there's not a majority in favor of withdrawing. There was not a majority in favor of declaring war. Uh, the Democratic leader, Dick Gebhardt, put a resolution forward to say, we approve of what the president's done, but not any, any approval going forward. This is not meant to give him any authority going forward. And that one uh, received a 213 in favor, 213 opposed vote. Um, I think illustrating what I said before about how reluctant members of Congress are to go on record on something that could hurt them politically. Um, when asked during the debate about this, I said I did not take an oath of office to be pop popular. Uh, I did not take an oath of office to be reelected. I took an oath, oath of office to uphold Sir. and defend the Constitution. So I have a question, Tom, that kind of turns this, this whole issue uh, upside down. We're talking about war powers, going to war. and the Constitution is clear that, you know, Congress has the right to declare war. The only entity that has the power to declare war is Congress of the United States. I'm not a lawyer and I'm illiterate when it comes to matters of law, 
But this is a great opportunity for me, and perhaps many of our viewers who are like me, uh, 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 laymen, uh, ordinary citizens, who have this question. Who decides when the United States of America needs to be defended? Who makes the decision not to go to war, but to defend the United States? I take the other side of it. Um, and has the Constitution even addressed the issue of defense of the nation? And what constitutes, similar to the question that, that uh, Joellen, uh, Dr. Chatham, uh, asked about the precise definitions of appropriate and necessary, which is very open, open grounds for debate. But this issue of defending the United States, and the reason I ask this is because we now live in the age of information. I think we face somewhat the obsolescence of many of definitions that were created, were defined for the age of agriculture, perhaps for the age of industry, but in the age of information, hostility is defined differently. Uh, territorial definitions uh, are defined differently. For example, we have the physical territory, but how about our cyber domains? How about when people are, are actually obfuscating hostility in such a way that we don't know who's attacking us? Um, who determines what those conditions are that would, that would lead the executive, the commander in chief to say, hey, I don't need to go to anybody ask for permission to defend the United States. I'm gonna make that determination. So specifically, is there a constitutional mandate that gives the president of the United States the right to defend the United States and perhaps, perhaps I'm talking myself into siding with Congress and being a little, little kinder to God, Congress, a lack of, lack of will of uh, decision-making and all that, notwithstanding, uh, perhaps I'm trying to justify why Congress has uh, equated in some ways to this situation. Uh, is there a definition of what uh, constitutes a condition in which the commander in chief must act based on the executive powers to defend the United States. The constitution only refers to calling out the militia to suppress rebellion or to repel invasion. Uh, that's the only reference to powers outside of declaring war. Now, once war is declared, of course, the president has all of the authority of commander in chief. So this gray area that you perceptibly identify uh, cyber war, uh, drones, uh, uh, espionage. Uh, Space, which has no law. <laughs> it, 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 well, I think, I think it does. We're, 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 we're testing whether uh, we can put together a regime uh, that will be enforceable. Uh, President Obama uh, bombed uh, Libya. And when presented with the obvious fact that that's an act of war, he said, well, um, no American pilots were ever at risk. Uh, now that let us agree that cannot be the right decision. If 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 the president can take action so long as no U.S. military are put at risk, then all it would take for an adversary of the United States to do is to kill one United States soldier, and then suddenly it has to go to Congress. What, what an absurd result! So President Obama has to be chided for having put that thought forward. Uh, so you have to go to the scheme of the Constitution, and no one doubts that when America is under attack, it is the president who needs to respond quickly and sometimes not even before Congress can even assemble uh, if he were inclined to bring Congress together to to consider it. Uh, Congressman, so, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt a little bit because time is fleeting. Uh, I'm going to let Joe Ellen ask maybe one fairly short question then we're going to have to wrap this up and probably have to invite you back a third time to uh, continue this discussion. But Joe Ellen, you want a final question? Yes. Uh, in fact, I think we should all enroll in Tom's class at Chapman. <laughs> um, Tom, this is, this is this gets kind of personal because you were in Congress, you dealt with this. And when I was writing my dissertation, I, I read the congressional record for the first 14 years of Congress. And in those early years, the debate over issues often centered around does the Constitution allow us to do this? Is this constitutional? They didn't always agree, but they were asking the questions. I'm a C-SPAN addict. 
I very seldom hear members of Congress talk about the Constitution unless they're trying to impeach the president, whether it was, you know, Trump or somebody else, unless it's a political issue. Um, they're very willing to defer their responsibility to administrative agencies. They're willing to defer their responsibilities to the president through giving him more power or to say, oh, let the courts decide. How can we, what is the recipe for electing people like yourself, liberal or conservative, that's irrelevant at this point, who will pay attention to the role and the, it is the first branch of government for a reason. It is the policy making the legislative making branch of government, and they've abdicated power. What can the American people do to kind of hold them accountable? You did that with what you did with the, the situation in Kosovo. I, I put it to the people's representatives. They had to vote yes or no. And then the people whom they represent could judge them. Uh, and whether they should be returned to office or not. That is fundamentally the check. That is it. Uh, but you can't exercise that check unless people are put on the record. As long as a member of Congress says, well, that's not for me to decide. I'll just let the, con the president do it. Or your constitutional issue is interesting, but it doesn't concern me because the courts will decide it. As long as members of Congress are, get away with that, uh, because the people who vote for them do not care, uh, they will continue that practice. So it comes down to the fundamental check within our system, and that is the people's vote. It come, it's come back to we the people, because we the people reelect about 90%, 95% of congressmen every year. We're not making change because we don't pay attention. So we can complain, but at the end of the day, as Jim Song says in the musical that we'll hear later on this series, we, are the people, we are the we, it's up to us. Thank you, Tom, so much. Pleasure. State, state Senator, finance, or State Finance Director, Congressman, Dean, Tom Campbell, <laughs> I will hear you say that uh, I would vote for you for president in a heartbeat, and I wish you were president uh, soon. So, so keep that in mind, but, but thank you for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your thoughts with us, filling in the blanks. Uh, it's just been enormously wonderful. And thanks again, coming back a second time. There may be as well be a third. So Thank next you. time we'll have our 12th session, which will be United States Marine Corps Major General James Williams, retired. Major General James Williams, retired. is one of Americans' modern heroes from my standpoint, and I think you will agree, who's working to prepare our next generation of, of citizens. And it's really important work. In the meantime, of course, thank you all for being with us. Thanks again to our guest, uh, Tom Campbell, as well as my co-hosts, Bijan and, and Joellen. And uh, if you wish, you mentioned, Joellen mentioned songs of convention, the birth of America. You could go to judgejimgray.com and hear all of the songs you want. Advanced songs, if you wish. It's not cheating to go backwards or forwards. So <laughs> please do that. And in addition, if you're interested, you can certainly follow the convention, the day-to-day -day log of what happened each day in the Constitutional Convention by going to the blog at Concordia University, Irvine Center for Public Policy. So with all of that, please join us again next week. We're happy to have you uh, be host. We'll have that the wonderful guest again, see if he can be as good as the one we had today. Tom, thank you for being with us. Thank you all and good evening.